we proceed with our uh, simulation of a two machine system. In the previous lecture, we kind of uh, uh, I gave you an idea how you can formulate the equations. We will actually uh, go through the, all the equations once and then uh, go ahead and uh, actually simulate. I will show you the results of the simulation for uh, various disturbances like uh, load change as well as uh, faults. Okay. Now, uh, this is lecture number 37 and uh, what we will be doing here is of course, continuing with our simulation of a two machine system. So, let us uh, just have a relook at what the system we were trying to simulate. This is the simulation system uh, simulation and this is the initial steady state operating condition. Okay. Now, we will take this as the beginning or the starting point of the simulation. In fact, uh, you can say this is the load flow uh, situation okay. and uh, of course, the first step of any simulation is to back calculate initial conditions. So, if I know the voltage is here, then I can get the values of for example, all the states and the field voltages of both generators based on the voltage at the terminals and the currents in steady state which are coming out. And of course, from the conditions from all the you know specifications which are given for this scenario, you should be able to find out the voltage and the angles as well as the current output of the machine which will enable you as I said to compute the initial conditions. You can refer to our simulation of a synchronous machine with an AVR connected to an infinite bus. We did that uh, several lectures ago where I actually showed you how you can from the terminal conditions calculate all the initial conditions. So, let us look at uh, the synchronous machine equations okay, for the two machine system. I mean this includes both the machines and also how you will interface them. So, of course, you know that the basic differential equations of uh, a synchronous machine okay, uh, with the stator transients neglected, we have just four differential equations per machine. Okay. So, uh, when I say network transients neglected, what I mean also is that stator transients also are neglected. When I say stator transients are neglected, what I mean of course, is that d psi d by d t and d psi q by d t terms of the synchronous machine have been set to 0 and uh, the corresponding differential equation has been converted to an algebraic equation. So, what we have essentially are the differential equations of the rotor windings g h f and k. Okay. And uh, we also have a, a differential equation corresponding to a simple static exciter plus AVR model. In the previous class, I told you that uh, the AVR plus static exciter is modeled just by a transfer function k k a upon 1 plus s t a. Okay? That is the form of the transfer function as a result of which it actually is uh, embodying the differential equation in a state x c which is given here. And of course, E f d the field voltage is uh, equal to x c except when x c hits limits. If x c hits limits, we kind of clip E f d to those limits. Okay? So, this is basically the static excitation system model. This is the same for both the machines to keep things simple, we have considered uh, similar parameters for both the machines. Okay? The turbine governor model is also kind of a, a transfer function. Of course, you can write the state space equation corresponding to this transfer function that not that is something which I have not written here, but you can easily uh, you know infer that this first order transfer function k 1 plus 2 s upon 1 plus 6 s is actually embodying a single uh, differential equation. Okay. So, effectively you can write down this uh, transfer function in state space form where the input is the error in the frequency or the deviation of the speed from the reference value and uh, the mechanical power is of course, uh, the set point the load set point p m 0 plus the output of this governor delta p m. Okay. So, uh, p m of course, is limited okay. and uh, uh, out here you see as in a static excitation uh, plus AVR model the turbine governor model in fact, the governor model effectively has a gain k. Remember that the governor is a proportional type controller in this case. Okay. So, what we are considering is proportional type controllers in both synchronous machines. Okay. 
So, the turbine governor model the steady state gain is not infinity like in an integral controller. Okay. It has got a finite uh, steady state gain. Okay. The mechanical equations of course, are uh, the rate of change of uh, the rotor uh, rotor position that is if theta is equal theta is of course, the rotor position. So, if theta is equal to omega t plus delta then d delta by d t of course, is given by omega minus omega naught and the rate of change of speed is of course, the torque equation and uh, in per unit of course, T m and P m are uh, uh, practically the same. The assumption of course, is whatever transients we are going to study the speed deviation from the nominal will not be too much. So, mechanical torque in per unit is the same as uh, is practically the same as the mechanical power in per unit. Okay. Now, if you look at the next equation uh, rather a few more clarifications here. Remember that omega b in all what I have written is the base angular speed. Okay. Omega naught is basically such that theta is equal to omega naught p t plus delta is the rotor position. Okay. So, delta is equal to theta minus omega naught t. In this study, let us take omega naught to be equal to omega b. So, what basically we are saying is that the base frequency and omega naught are taken to be the same. In fact, another the thing we will assume in this example to keep things uh, simpler uh, is basically assume that the steady state frequency is no, uh, nothing but the base frequency. Okay. So, this is some simplifications which we are going to consider. We have the algebraic equation for both machines. In fact, along the d axis and the q axis, uh, the first algebraic equation is something of course, you know. Uh, we derived the synchronous machine model. The second algebraic equation is actually got by assuming that d psi d by d t is equal to 0 and in that in this particular equation uh, this this term here should have been omega, but we have approximated it to be omega b. Okay. So, this particular algebraic equation has got constant coefficients into uh, the, uh, these uh, variables psi q i d and v d. Similarly, on the q axis you have got this algebraic equation this is of course, derived from the synchronous machine model and this algebraic equation is in fact obtained by setting psi d psi d by d t and d psi uh, rather d psi q by d t equal to 0. Okay. So, the same approximations apply here as well as here. Okay. So, we have got in fact 4 differential equations per uh, you know you have got 4 equations of the synchronous machine rotor windings. Okay and uh, one e differential equation for the static excitation plus AVR, one differential equation for the simplified governor model turbine governor model. Okay. So, that gives you basically 6 equations uh, algebraic uh, differential equations per machine. Okay. So, there are 2 machines there will be 12 states in fact, but the algebraic equations per machine are 4. Okay. So, 4 algebraic equations per machine and they are listed down here. Okay. Now, uh, remember one thing what I have shown you so far is the synchronous machines in uh, the parks reference frame. So, you, when you derive it for each machine, uh, you will be using the parks reference frame native to that synchronous machine. Okay. But if I use a transformation C k instead of C p, okay, where instead of using theta as the argument of the cosine and sine terms here, I use omega naught t remember delta is missing here you know if it was omega t plus delta it would be theta corresponding to a synchronous machine. Okay. So, instead of having two different transformations for two different machines what I will do is use a common transformation whenever I am going to interface the variables corresponding to this two synchronous machines. Okay. So, what uh, this will become clear in a moment. So, the a b c variables of course, are the same. Okay. All what we are doing is changing using the transformation c k to what is known as the d q variables. Okay. So, if you look at uh, how these transformations and the variables are related you get the equation as shown here. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, uh, you know you just do c k inverse c p 1 or do c p 1 inverse c k you can get a relationship between 
f d 1 f q 1 and f d 2 uh, 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 f uppercase d 1 and uppercase q 1. Okay. So, this relationship is essentially a, a matrix relationship, but you can easily see that it, uh, it is it, it essentially gives you a can be comp, uh, compactly written by this complex relationship. Okay. Similarly, for machine 2 if I use uh, you know C p 2 which, which uses uh, the argument for the cosines and sines as theta 2 is equal to omega naught t plus delta 2, we will get basically the relationship between the capital or rather the upper case q and d variables as related to the local uh, variables which use the local Parkes transformation. Okay. So, whenever I am going to uh, what I will do is I will get the equations to the upper case q and d variables. Okay. The lower case q and d variables are using a transformation which is native to that machine. Okay. The upper case d and q transformations are for machine 1 as well as machine 2 both use c k okay, which is independent of theta uh, delta. Okay. So, whenever we are going to uh, so f q 1 and f d 1 upper case are in fact variables which are obtained for common transformation. So, f q 1, f q 2, f d 1 and f d 2 upper case are in fact obtained from a the same transformation. Okay. So, the point is that if if all the a b c variables are uh, transformed using a common transformation c k, then we can use k v l and k c l that is Kirchhoff voltage law and Kirchhoff current law while writing down when interfacing both machines. Okay. Now, the important thing is you do not have to transform all the differential equations to the upper case d q variables at all. What we need to do is whenever we are interfacing these variables, whenever you are writing the algebraic constraints relating to these variables, okay, that time you should ensure that the, all the, the variables involved in that interface are obtained using a common transformation c k. Okay. Otherwise, you will not be able to use uh, the algebraic relationships uh, which are obtained from Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws. Okay. So, that will become quite clear now. If you look at the algebraic equations um, corresponding to both machines, okay. what I have done is the algebraic the variable psi d lower case, psi q lower case, i d lower case and i q lower case have all been transformed. The equations have been transformed. The same relationship is there but now I am using different variables, I am writing the same relationship in terms of different variables. Now, the interesting thing is that if I write down these algebraic equations okay, in terms of the upper case variables, I will have to combine those you know equations in fact and you get this kind of form of the equations. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that if you choose x t double dash and x q double dash to be equal, what you find is that the capital D variables psi d is related to i d by simply x t double dash, psi q is related to i q also by x t double dash. So, if you assume that the sub transient saliency is not there that is x t double dash and x q double dash are equal, then an interesting thing which follows is that the algebraic equation corresponding to psi upper case d is related to i upper case d by a simple constant coefficient which is not dependent on delta. Okay. The other terms are all gathered out here and they are all states. Okay. F 1 is a function of the states. Okay. So, this is a nonlinear function of the states. So, the algebraic equations effectively have been rewritten in terms of the capital D q variables. Now, this of course, can be done for both the machines. Okay. So, when you are talking of machine 1, you will have of course, an additional subscript of 1 everywhere. Okay. So, of course, I have not done that, but remember that this has to be done for both machines. Okay. So, what you will have effectively is that these 4 algebraic equations for each machine, for both machines there will be 4 algebraic equations, but remember that the variables in these 4 algebraic equations will be having a common transformation from the a b c variables. So, you can actually use these upper case d and q variables directly whenever you are using any algebraic constraints like k v l or k c l. Okay. 
if I neglect, of course, if I neglected the stator transient, that is d psi d by d t as set to equal to zero and d psi q by d t as set equal to zero, then there is no real logic in uh, retaining the fast transients associated with the network. Remember that the network is, was already simplified. You know, we may got a lumped RL model from what was essentially a partial differential equation model. Okay. So, that is of course, a big jump I mean a big modeling simplification. Now, we go ahead and do another modeling simplification that is we neglect the network transients. Okay. So, if you neglect the network network transients, then the equations are essentially like this. Okay. V d 1 and V q 1 and V d 2 and V q 2 are the terminal voltages of the synchronous two synchronous machines and both are of course, obtained using a common d q transformation. Okay. So, you can get them and subtract them. Uh, they are kind of compatible. Okay. So, we can use uh, the voltage on either side of course, is obtained from a common transformation. So, this equation is actually valid. Okay. We could not have for example, written down here small a uh, lower case d 1 and q 1 and lower case d 2 and q 2 that would be incorrect. Okay. So, remember that this change is there. Okay. So, what we have effectively done is obtain these uh, algebraic equations of the network from the essentially from the differential equation of the lumped R L model of the interconnection. There are some more algebraic equations. What we have done essentially is what is V D 1 and V Q 1? Since there is a resistive load, if you focus on this uh, diagram which is here, if this is a resistive load, okay, it is a unity power factor load, but I also additionally say that it is a you know kind of a resistive load. So, the voltage here is equal to the current into the resistance. Okay. If the resistance is R L 1, okay, then uh, you know the voltage and the current are simply related by an algebraic relationship. Okay. Now, so the what is the current flowing through this? It is the current of the generator okay, minus the current to the line. Okay. If I call this current to the line as I L, okay, in that case, so, you will have V q 1 is equal to R L 1 into the difference of the generator current minus the line current. Okay. Now, this 1 and 2 actually are superfluous, actually this should be just I L q, this 1 is not necessary. Okay. So, this is a small error which you should correct. V d 1 is equal to R L 1 into I d 1 minus I L d. Please remember to remove this 1 here. Okay. It is not required, there is only one line current. Okay. So, there is no need of this ad additional subscript 1 out here. Similarly, V q 2 is equal to R L 2 into the current through the resistance. Okay, That is the generator current plus the interconnection or line current. Okay, Again, please neglect this superscript 2 here, which appears in this term I L q. Okay. So, just remove this super subscript, I am sorry. So, you can remove this subscript. Okay. So, you have got this these algebraic equation, please remember to make these corrections. So, eventually you have got 16 states. What are the 16 states? In fact, uh, these are delta 1, omega 1, then the 4 rotor windings of the first machine, then the state corresponding to the st simplified AVR and uh, exciter model and x g 1 is a state corresponding to a simplified turbine governor model. Okay. Similarly, you have got the same thing for the other machine. So, there will be a total of 16 states and the algebraic equations are 14. You could have counted all the algebraic equations 4 for each generator that will become 8 plus 6 equations which I just described some time back. Okay. 2 of course, for the line and uh, the 4 equations which I just mentioned some time back. Uh, remember that the number of variables algebraic variables also are 14. So, it should be possible whenever you are writing a program to actually use uh, you know uh, you can solve the algebraic equations uh, and write them in terms of the states. Okay. So, this is something you can uh, do remember that uh, at every point okay, at every uh, instant of your simulation on numerical integration remember that psi d 1, i d 1, uh, psi q 2, uh, psi q 1, uh, i i q 1 and so on are dependent on the states. So, if you recall that if you look at these equations here, 
you see that eventually psi d this equation is dependent on the states. Okay. So, there is an overall dependence on the states just remember that okay. there is an overall dependence on the states. Okay. Now, we begin our simulation remember all the assumptions we have been uh, which we have made. Okay. We have made lots and lots of them, but uh, some of the important ones are that we are considering we are going to consider relatively slower phenomena, we are not going to consider very fast they are basically we are going to study electromechanical transients and uh, what uh, what we of course, done is uh, also assumed in some cases uh, replaced omega by omega b. So, what the assumption is that you are not deviating too much from uh, omega b. So, all our studies are for frequencies which are near the nominal frequency is it okay. Now, let us get back to uh, our uh, case studies. So, I will just get uh, get you to that slide. Remember, we have made uh, simple models of the AVR and turbine governor. So, this is something you can watch on your screen. So, once you have made uh, the simplified models and obtained the differential equations and of course, made a few more assumptions. Will you of course, considering three phase balanced disturbances, there would not be any unbalanced disturbances, the synchronous machine data and I have done the programming uh, for analyzing the system. The first result which I have, uh, want to put forth to you are the eigenvalues of the system for obtained after a small signal analysis around the equilibrium point corresponding to this situation. Okay. So, if you look at the situation again, this is the equilibrium situation, I have back calculated the condition, linearized the differential equations. Okay. We have done this before, so I am not doing it again okay. and I have actually tried to obtain the eigenvalues of the system for this equilibrium point. So, if I give small disturbances, the behavior will be captured uh, by the linearized uh, kind of response of the system okay, for small disturbances. So, if you look at the eigenvalues of the system, uh, there are some interesting things you will see. If you have uh, no governor, okay. if you got no governor, there are two 0 eigenvalues, okay. then you have got you will have two 0 eigenvalues and then you have got a low frequency oscillatory mode, okay, which is not so well damped. Okay, so, this is a low frequency oscillatory mode which is not so well damped I am sorry. You also have other eigenvalues some with relatively large real part okay, and some very large eigenvalues on the right hand side. So, without governor if I consider network and stator transients that is I do not neglect d psi d by d t d psi q by d t okay, as well as d i d and d i q by d t of the network in that case you will have some very high frequency or high magnitude eigenvalues corresponding to fast transients. Okay. So, this is what you get. Okay. What are these two 0 eigenvalues? Remember I had uh, mentioned to you that whenever you have got a system like this, this is just an analogy a two mass spring system. You, The thing is that if you have got essentially a swing mode which is an oscillatory mode okay, as well as two 0 eigenvalues. Why do you get these two 0 eigenvalues? You have got essentially if there is no friction of this surface then your response has two components okay, corresponding to these 0 eigenvalues. They are repeated eigenvalues and in this case in fact, you can show that you are going to get for the spring mass system. Uh, response terms e raise to 0 t and t e raise to 0 t. We have discussed this long time back when we were considering linearized analysis. When you have got repeated eigenvalues, you can in some cases get this kind of response. Okay. In fact, if you do not have friction, we do get two 0 eigenvalues to for a two mass spring system. This is something you can verify by writing down the equations. Okay. So, what does this mean is, is that if I give uh, if for example, these two masses have equal initial velocities say v 0 is equal to 1 and v 
v 2 0 is equal to 1, both these masses will move if there is no friction they will keep on moving getting what I am trying to say. So, they will keep on moving in case there is no friction. So, what you will find is that the displacement from an arbitrary reference will have a variation of t, because if you give an initial condition in these states which are equal, you will find that this just keeps on moving. So, it is not surprising that you have got these two 0 eigenvalues and therefore, you have got this kind of response. Okay? So, remember that when you do not have a governor, what does it mean? It means that you do not have any control over the load generation balance. Okay? You do not have any control. So, it is equivalent to having a situation where you have got constant external forces acting on this mass spring system, okay? but no friction. There is no, no frequency dependence of these external forces. Okay? So, if there was friction of course, things would be different. In fact, by putting a governor what you are doing is essentially making some external force on the system which is proportional to the change in velocity. Okay? So, in fact, a governor changes the mechanical power okay, with in response to omega minus omega, omega ref minus omega. What it means essentially is that you are introducing a kind of a viscous damping coefficient into your you know torque equation. Okay? And as a result of which when you have a governor, you do not have these two 0 eigenvalues. So, that is an interesting point. Okay? So, just remember this. Remember that in case you have got a load which is frequency dependent or your you have got a turbine governor enabled you will get only one 0 eigenvalue, because in that case you do not expect this T e raise to 0 t term to be there. In fact, if you, in case you have friction and you have got an initial velocity, you will find that eventually this mass will grind to some halt, uh, grind to a halt after some time. Okay? So, you cannot have this kind of term in case there is this viscous damping introduced by either load dependence on frequency or mechanical power dependence on frequency which is introduced by a governor. Okay? So, in this case of course, our load is a constant resistance. So, of course, you do not expect that the load to be frequency dependent. So, if you do not have a governor, you will have two 0 eigenvalues and T e 0 T kind of response. Okay? Remember of course, that even if you put a governor, there is still be a 0 eigenvalue or in effect a response term which is equal to e raise to 0 t. Why is that so? Remember that if in this mass spring system, if my response is x 1 t, okay, if your response is x 1 t and x 2 t, you can add an arbitrary constant term to both of them and still your differential equations will be satisfied. Okay. So, an interesting point is that if your solution to your delta 1 and delta 2 or in this case for a spring mass system the displacements x 1 and x 2 is x 1 t, then x 1 t plus x 0 also will satisfy your uh, differential equation. This is because whenever x 1 and x 2 appear in your differential equations or even in this uh, synchronous machine e example you will find that everything depends on the difference of the angles. The absolute value of delta 1 and delta 2 does not determine the electrical powers etcetera. Okay? None of the components in this system are dependent solely on the absolute or uh, 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 the actual angle at phase angle at a given point. Okay? For example, the power flow, the steady state power flow here depends on the difference of the angles at the two ends. It does not depend for example, on this alone. Okay? So, what it follows is that if your delta 1 and delta 2 are solutions are the responses following a disturbance or even the steady state responses. If I add a constant term, okay, a constant term is x 0 e raise to 0 t which is nothing but x 0 itself. Okay. Then also your differential equations are satisfied. Therefore, do not be surprised when you do an eigenvalue analysis and find out that you are getting a 0 eigenvalue whenever you are studying this kind of system with the kind of differential equation and uh, differential 
algebraic formulation which we have written. Okay. So, of course, whenever you do an Eigen analysis also another thing you try to remember is that you may not get this as exactly 0 whenever you do a numerical analysis. You may get this slightly non-zero, but that will be because of numerical errors, okay, precision errors. So, of course, when you have a governor, now coming back to this problem, having a governor introduces changes the 0 eigenvalue to a negative real eigenvalue, which implies that there cannot be any t e raise to 0 t kind of terms okay, in your response. Another thing is that two additional eigenvalues come about because there are two extra states which we have considered with when you model a turbine governor. If you also of course, assume that the mechanical power is constant that is what this without governor means you will not have these additional two eigenvalues, but when you have a governor you will have these additional eigenvalues. Okay. Again remember that when we consider network transients we have got these high frequency terms. Okay. If you neglect network transients in that case, you will find of course, that the high frequency terms are missing, but other than that you have got again these 0 eigenvalues. Okay. You also have the low frequency oscillation terms, these are also called the swing modes okay. and you have also got additional modes because of their many many more states, okay. but the important modes which you need to remember are the 0 eigenvalues and the swing modes. These are associated with electromechanical transients. Remember of course, that how do I know that? I cannot, I have just stated this fact, I have not proved that these eigenvalues are associated with the electromechanical variables deltas and omegas, but in fact you can actually prove this using participation analysis which we discussed some time back. You can associate the modes with electromechanical transients, primarily with the electromechanical transients, but of course, this does not mean that uh, these, these modes are not dependent on the other states, okay. but when I say electromechanical modes, these are essentially primarily associated with deltas and omegas. Okay. The other states also influence these modes, but they are primarily associated with delta and omega that is what I want to say. So, with governor and without governor you have similar behavior with and without network transients con considered. Okay. You still have a similar behavior. So, we can to some extent justify this approximation of neglecting stator and network transients. Okay. So, we go to case 1. Now, I will quickly go through a few simple disturbances. Suppose, I have got this uh, I give a step change in this load. Okay. I change this resistance from 0.52 per unit to 0.7 per unit. So, actually the load reduces because the resistance has reduced uh, sorry resistance has increased. Okay. So, if there is a load throw off that some part of this load has been removed. Okay. In that case, if I do not have governors, if I look at various quantities, first thing you will find is the rotor angular difference increases or rather decreases. Why does it decrease? From 45 degrees it comes to roughly uh, 40 degrees. Okay. So, the angular difference delta 1 minus delta 2 Okay, both are you know you know rotating and the angular difference between them is around 40 degrees after the disturbance while it was 45 degrees before the disturbance. Why does that happen? Well, one way of looking at it is that when you throw off some load here, the load here reduces on this line reduces. So, the angular difference between these two buses reduces okay, and the corresponding rotor angle also reduces. Okay. Now, remember when you say no governor, you are not changing the mechanical power. So, if I do not change the mechanical power, remember this is like a frictionless system. In fact, there is no dependence of the external powers mechanical or load powers on the frequency and if there is a load generation mismatch, what you of course, find is omega 1, omega 2 as well as the center of inertia frequency which is defined as h 1 omega 1 plus h 2 omega 2 divided by h 1 plus h 2 both linearly increase. Okay. So, you see this linear increase and of course, if you allow this to continue then after a point your generators will be tripped out. The reason is that uh, if your frequency goes uh, greatly away from the nominal frequency 
there is a chance that you will uh, damage the uh, turbine uh, and generator system. Why is that so? Actually, it turns out that the turbine is made out of blades. Okay, they are made out of blades, and you've got a steam flow through this, through these blades. Okay, along this periphery, okay, the steam flow is not uniform. Okay. It is not perfectly uniform, there are variation, natural variations in the steam flow. So, your steam flow may be 0 to 360, maybe like this. Okay. So, it may be, of course, this is an exaggerated uh, electrical engineering or electrical engineer's description of what happens. Now, what happens is that in case your rotational frequency deviates from nominal, okay, if it deviates from nominal, you will find that these turbine blades start getting okay start getting periodic forces across uh, means are applied across the blade so if your steam flow is changing there is a variation of steam flow and you're running at the base speed you will of course see that the force on the blades is actually changing okay now the thing is if you deviate from this omega b the frequency of the force which these blades see will change. Now, what happens is in case the frequency which of the forces which these blades see starts coinciding with the natural vibration of these blades, okay, then there will be a huge displacement. See, you are giving a periodic force which is equal to the natural vibration frequency of the blades. If that happens at a certain frequency, Okay. If the rotational frequency deviates from omega b, then you will find that the frequency of the forces on the blades also changes and if it coincides with the natural frequency of vibration, the blades will get damaged. Okay. So, nobody allows especially a steam turbine in a steam turbine uh, generator system, nobody allows you to deviate the frequency to deviate much away from the uh, nominal speed because typically you will find that after around a 1 hertz deviation from the nominal 1 or 1 and a half hertz from the nominal you may start coinciding with the resonant frequency the forces which are incident on these blades start coincide uh, the frequency of that starts coinciding with the natural frequency of the blades. Okay. So, that may damage the blades. So, no after us certain speed deviation either on the positive direction or the negative direction, uh, you may have to trip out the generator. You either have an over speeding control which suddenly changes the mechanical power like a governor or you have to trip out the generator. Okay. So, this is not acceptable. Okay. Of course, remember that because the angular speeds are changing does not mean that the machines are losing synchronism. So, if you look at the difference frequencies, it is constant. In fact, omega 1 minus omega 2 is constant. Only thing is that center of inertia speed is increasing okay, because of the unbalanced external force, because you have changed the load generation balance. Also, the line power, okay, which is line power comes to a constant. So, actually from a point of view of synchronism, synchronism is not, uh, if you look at it, we are not gone out of, we have not gone out of step. The mechanical powers are constant, the center of inertia frequency is changing, but the relative speeds are in fact constant. So, we are not lost synchronism, we are, what we are saying is that the overall frequency has changed. Okay? So, that is something you have to keep in mind, we are not talking of a relative motion instability, we are talking of a continuous change in the center of inertia speed. Okay. So, both machines are almost together decelerating or in this case they are accelerating together, they are not they are moving together, but they are both accelerating. Okay. If you look at a case 2 with the governors are enabled, what you notice is of course, the mechanical the transient looks a bit different and in fact, it settles down to a different value. Okay. You look at the uh, angular difference, it settles down to 32 degrees instead of 40 degrees in the previous case, the angular speeds reach an equilibrium. There is a decrease in this, there is an increase in the center of inertia speed as well as the speed of each individual mass, rotor mass, 
but eventually the speed reaches an equilibrium. Okay? The equilibrium speed is not equal to the previous speed. In fact, if you note, note something that the governors are proportional type governors in the sense that the mechanical power is changed using an algorithm like this. The governor has got this kind of uh, you know transfer function and of course, the turbine has got a transfer function. Okay, so, the turbine governor transfer function is k 1 plus 2 s upon 1 plus 6 s. Now, this k is a proportional controller effectively. It is also the inverse of the droop characteristic of the machine. Now, the point is that you can change the mechanical output of the machine only if omega ref and omega are not equal. So, in case uh, uh, this proportional gover kind of governor will always give you a steady state error. So, your frequency does not come back to the original frequency. Okay? There is a frequency change that is something which you should remember. The mechanical speeds, the different speeds, the relative motion is stable, it is not unstable. Okay? The speeds the different speeds become equal to 0, but the overall speed of both the machines settles down to a higher value. Here the mechanical power are changing. Why are they changing? Because we are having a governor. Okay? So, if you have got a governor, your mechanical power will change and of course, the line powers also will change because governor is present here as well as here. Okay? So, the point is that if governors are present on both machines, each of them will change the mechanical power. If they change the mechanical power, the overall power flow situation changes. Okay? So, a load has changed, mechanical power here is changed and the mechanical power here is changed. So, if all the three things change, you will find the frequency goes to a new equilibrium and you know your line power also settles to a different value. The angular difference between the two buses also will settle down to different values. Okay? Now, of course, the point which you should note here is that governors on both machines are present. Now, what if we had just one governor or a governor present only on one machine? Basically, your mechanical power of only one machine would change, only one machine would take on the load change. Okay? And of course, if you just had governor on one machine, only one person would contribute to the uh, you know to trying to get the frequency to equilibrium. So, if you keep the same gain and just disable one governor your frequency deviation will be more, only one generator will respond to the load changes. Okay? It can also be inferred that since the load, the amount of power change of each uh, turbine is proportional to k into omega ref minus omega, by changing k or omega ref, you can in fact change the amount of contribution of each generator. Okay? So, why is that so? Because Remember that the speed eventually, if you are remaining in synchronism, speed of both machines is going to be the same. Okay? Now, if speed is the same and omega ref of both machines is the same, then the amount of power change each generator takes up okay, is proportional to omega ref minus omega into k. Okay? So, if k1 and k2 are different, I mean you have got two different gains or two different droops on the, gen gover uh, on the generators of each machine. In that case, you will find that the each generator takes on different load change. A kind of extreme condition is where the gain of one generator of one governor is much, much, much higher. Like uh, one of the governors, for example, has a steady state gain of you know 300 and the other has got a gain of 10. In that case, the governor, assuming omega refs are the same, the governor with a larger gain takes on more, uh, more of the load. Okay, it takes, it increases its mechanical power more, whereas the other generator does not increase its mechanical power as much. Okay, now the extreme condition is where you've got an integral controller on one of the governors. Okay, an integral controller essentially has got infinite gain. Okay, in steady state, you know, one upon s. Remember, so you will get infinite gain in steady state. So if you got one governor which has got an integral gain, it will take on the complete load change and the other governor will be left high and dry in the sense it will not contribute anything uh, to trying to maintain frequency. Of course, this is assuming omega ref on both machines is the same. Okay? Now, just think of, think about it. Can you have integral controllers on both governors? This is something you need to think about. Okay? This is a question which 
not obvious, you think over it a bit. You cannot have in fact, uh, both governors having integral gain. Okay. Why it is so is something you can think about. Now, the third case is not a load change. What we will do is, uh, we will have a three phase fault. It is a balanced fault at bus 1 at 1 second and we will clear the fault at after 80 milliseconds. Okay, That is 4 cycles. Now, of course, remember that post fault conditions are assumed to be same as pre fault conditions. So, it is a kind of temporary fault. Okay, It is uh, we just come back. Uh, so, when the fault is cleared. So, you can consider this as a situation where in bus 1, suppose you had got an open line. This is your oops your bus, this is a generator 2, this is a generator 1, the same system, this is a load and this is a load. Okay. So, this is your same system and you have got a transmission line out here which is open circuited here at this end, it is a short transmission line and you have got a three phase fault on this line near about this bus. Okay. In that case, you will have a short circuit at this bus, a three phase short circuit at this bus, which has to be cleared by opening the line. The post fault and the pre fault situation is going to be the same. When before the fault, you had connected an open line here, it is a short open line. So, it is like having nothing here. You had a fault for some time, which is cleared by opening the line. So, what you have is pre fault and pre post fault situation is the same. Okay. Assuming of course, this is a short line and open circuited short line is effectively doing nothing to the system initially. Okay. So, under these circumstances what you find is if your clearing time is this much, you will find that delta 1 minus delta 2 in fact is stable. Okay. Since pre fault and post fault systems are equal, you will find that there is no change in the load generation balance situation nor are the flows changed. So, the losses also do not change. So, your angular speed simply comes back to the original value. Okay, they are transients, but the overall angular speed settles down. So, it is a stable large disturbance. Okay, it is stable for this large disturbance. Okay. Omega 1 minus omega 2 is the relative speed, it is also stable. Okay. The powers again are stable. Okay. Actually, uh, this simulation has been done considering network transients. We have model network transients. So, what you see essentially in the beginning of this transient here for example, are some high frequency components. So, if you consider network transients, you will get these high frequency components. Okay. There is a high frequency component here as well. So, this is how your delta 1 minus delta 2. Okay. If you neglect the network transients, you get almost a similar response. Okay. But remember, there is some, there are some differences. For example, the maximum deviation here is around 70 degrees. Whereas, when network transients were considered, it was almost 60 degrees. So, there was a 10 degree difference. Okay. So, when network transients are neglected, you do have some difference in the result. In fact, uh, network transients neglected gives you a somewhat larger angular deviation. And, uh, but otherwise, the response looks almost the same. You just see that there is no high frequency, uh, you know, transient, you know, because we have neglected network transients. Now, we will consider when we increase the fault clearing time to 0.28 seconds, okay. but the network transients of course, are neglected. The interesting thing is that the angular deviation under this circumstance grows in an unbounded fashion. Okay. So, if you have a larger clearing time, the fault is cleared, but after a long clearing time. So, a longer clearing time means that because of the sudden disturbance, uh, the deviation of the states from the post fault equilibria are going to be more. Okay. So, if your deviation is too much, you may not you know pull back into synchronism okay. as a result of which the relative angular motion is becomes unstable. So, please remember this is relative angular motion becoming unstable. If you look at the angular speeds, they too you know deviate from each other, although omega C O i is relatively you know within bounds omega 1 and omega 2, the relative angles increase. This is contrast this with the earlier situation. In the earlier situation when we had a load throw off without governors, 
omega c o i went on increasing, but the relative motion between them was stable. This is exactly the converse situation. Okay. So, what we have seen is that if you give a, a disturbance like a fault, which is not clear for a long time, you may go out of synchronism and you will see the relative motion is unstable. Okay. So, relative uh, out of synchronism refers to relative motion. Okay. If you look at the mechanical, uh, the electrical power output of each machine, you will find that it is oscillating. Okay, there is a kind of a oscill wild oscillations. In fact, it even reaches negative values, positive and negative values. So, if you lose synchronism, this is what what your mechanical power is going to look like. So, if your mechanical power is of course going to look like this, you cannot continue operating in this fashion. So, although I was kind of shown you a simulation which in which the loss of synchronism uh, kind of remains for several seconds. Okay, no action is taken. You are just allowing the angles to, you know, increase. Another word for it is the poles of both machines are slipping with respect to each other. So you're just allowing that to continue. If you allow it to continue, there will be wild oscillations in power, and you cannot operate in this fashion. You will damage the shaft, for example, of the machine. So what usually you do is that in case you detect an out of synchronism condition you will have to separate out the two machines. Okay. Now, if you separate out the two machines, you will have to essentially trip the interconnection between them. But remember, if I trip the interconnection between them, I will have basically another problem to contend with. What is that? The local load generation balance in these two islands, which have got, which have kind of disconnected, okay, is not uh, you know there is a fairly large generation imbalance in both these islands and you know then you have to really exert the governors as well as any emergency load shedding schemes may be required to quickly get an equilibrium in the center of inertia of each individual system or you know now they are disconnected systems okay so you have to ensure that the frequency of each system reaches an equilibrium okay so you have to really control the prime mover and load power on both systems once you disconnect. So, let us what I was was I telling you, you are interconnected, you gave a fault, the fault got cleared, you lost synchronism, there are wild variations in power. So, you cannot operate that way, you have to trip out the interconnection. Once you trip out the interconnection, you are left with another problem that is of load generation imbalance in the two disconnected islands, which has to be really sorted out. Okay. So, loss of synchronism is not a nice scenario and even if you manage to island or trip out or disconnect the two systems when they are lost synchronism. Why do you, do you need to disconnect? Because there is going to be wild oscillations in power, voltage and so on. So, you have to disconnect. Once you disconnect, you have got the problem of maintaining the frequency in the two individual systems which boils down to trying to maintain the load generation imbalance balance in these two systems. Okay? Now, of course, an interesting point is that if your power system experiences a loss of synchronism situation, usually there are out of step relays which detect this and trip. Also, an interesting point is that the wild deviations in voltage and current cause distance relays in a transmission system to mistake it for a fault and uh, it causes transmission line tripping. So, Whenever there is a loss of synchronism scenario, you may have uh, you know uh, what you call an uncontrolled splitting of the system okay, due to distance relay operations. Okay. So, you may have what I said that you need to disconnect the two machines, they may disconnect on their own in the sense that relays may actually trigger and trip out um, in case such a situation occurs. Okay. So, uh, there uh, we will kind of summarize this uh, very interesting study which we did on electromechanical transients in a two machine system. Okay. Uh, just remember of course, that we have considered the electromechanical uh, both the relative uh, frequency uh, relative motion as well as the center of inertia motion. There are other modes and patterns in this motion, they are not very well observable in this response. Uh, those patterns also can go unstable for example, if you do not design your control systems properly. For some inappropriate gain of AVR and govern, you may find some other modes which are not necessarily electromechanical modes also go unstable. Okay. So, these kind of things also can occur. We will summarize at least this electromechanical transients part 
uh, in the beginning of the next lecture and then move on to some understanding what happens when you have got more than two machines like our grid which is uh, more than more than 500 or so large machines synchronous machines all interconnected to each other okay so this is something we'll discuss in um, the next lecture